Philippians chapter 2. And uh, we'll read from verse 12. If you would stand for the reading of God's word, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. I'm just going to do two verses. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. Um, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the reading of God's word for the sermon. The church said, Amen. Now, as you sit, and, and if you're new to us and new to the evening, I did teach on this some time back. And uh, if you remember the, the teaching, uh, it will be a great um, refreshing for you. If you don't remember the teaching, uh, that's okay. It'll be a good reminder for you this evening. We're talking about working out our, our, our own salvation. What does it mean? Text talks about working out our own salvation. What does it mean? Well, the, the, let's give a basic a background very quickly, an overarching view of it, an overall view of it before we get into the text this, this evening. The epistle to the Philippians is uh, one of the prison epistles, as you recall, and it was written in Rome. We, will, uh, we, we recall from uh, the study of the book of Acts, uh, um, uh, from Acts chapter uh, 16, verse 12, at Philippi, uh, which the apostle visited on his second missionary journey. Um, this was when Lydia and the Philippian jailer and his family were converted to Christ. And then now some years later, the church was established, as we can see um, from Philippians 1.1, where um, Paul addresses the elders and the deacons. The theme of the, of, of the book covers uh, joy. Uh, speaking to Brother Simon, he asked me what the sermon was about, and I said, from Philippians, and he said, was it Was it joy? Uh, say, say, I said, yes, in some way it is joy. Um, this, we may even consider this epistle to be the epistle of joy. <laughs> and just a brief note about joy. When we speak about joy, we, we understand, we notice that there's a difference between, between the happiness that the world talks about and the joy that uh, God speaks of in his word. In most cases, happiness is dependent on circumstances. When many people, when they say they're happy, Their happiness is dependent on some kind of circumstance they're in. And when the circumstance changes, then you find that they're not happy anymore, but sad. And when you ask why, you find that it's because of some circumstance that has changed. Now, not so with joy in the Bible. Biblical joy is not dependent on circumstances. So what then is it dependent on? It's not dependent on on circumstances. It's dependent on the sovereignty of God. We see that evidenced in both the writer of the epistle and the recipients of the epistle. Paul wrote from prison, yet he has joy. And he, he, the recipients of the, of the epistle were also not in the best of circumstances at that time of their life, but they also had joy. Paul recognizes that. So his joy as a writer of the letter and their joy as the recipients of the letter was not depend, dependent on circumstances. For example, the circumstance being that Paul was in prison. So their joy was not dependent on circumstances, but on the sovereignty of God. Now in the vast amount of treasure that is in this uh, chapter, we will focus on just verse 12 to verse 13. And I'm going to do this over two parts. I'll do it this evening and then next Lord's Day evening. Two parts, so I won't rush this. The matter of our text is the matter of salvation. Verse 12 follows on from the great truth of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, if you read that. Notice the verse begins with a so, or in some of your Bible translations it says therefore. There is a so or a therefore. This means means verse 12 is a follow on from the previous verse. In other words, because of a truth in the previous verse, We are now called to act in verse 12. Therefore, there is a therefore or a so. It's a call to action. So what is the truth in the previous verse? Look at verse 9 to verse 11. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee will bow, 
of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? That's the previous verses. And so we see God, God highly exalted Jesus Christ. But why? Why? Why, God, why did God highly exalt Jesus Christ? Verse 9, to verse, verse 9 to verse 11. Well, the opening words of verse 9 tell us, it says, for this reason, for this reason, for this reason God highly exalted him. For what reason, you may ask? For what reason God highly exalted him? Well, we look then to the previous verses to that to get the answer to this. Verse 5 to verse 8. Having this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So we find the reason then. For this reason, that's the reason given. So on the basis of all this, on the basis of what happens in the previous verses, Paul now says, therefore, or some of your Bible translations might say, so, so therefore, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my absence, but now much more in, uh, uh, not only in my presence, but now, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work his good work. So this is dealing with salvation. This is dealing with salvation. But there are some words here that are, sometimes seem to cause a bit of confusion to us. A bit of problems in under, a, a bit of a problem in trying to understand this text. It is our understanding as we, uh, as we learn the Bible, it is our understanding that, that salvation is of the Lord and our works do not contribute to our salvation. We say by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There are no works on our part for that. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 10 tells us that for by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, right? You know that verse, you remember it. And so it is clear then that salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. If you understand that, and as Paul did, he understands that, why then does Paul direct the church to work out their salvation? Is Paul trying to confuse us here? Is, is he confused? No, he's not. Is he promoting a works-based salvation? No, he isn't. Certainly not. Paul is not promoting a works-based salvation when he says, work out your salvation. What then does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work his good work. What does this mean? What does Paul mean here? Well, again, from our study of salvation, we note that we note that there are two parts to our salvation. If you're taking our notes this evening, there are two parts to our salvation. The first part of our salvation consists of work for us. Work for us. The second part of our salvation is work in us. <coughs> work for us and work in us. Now the first part, work for us, is perfect. None can add to it. Nothing can be added to it. Not even we ourselves can add to it. Jesus Christ our Lord has offered a complete atonement for all the sins and transgressions of his people. In this salvation, we become partakers of his everlasting life in, and, and inheritors of his glory. Saints, therefore, are saved completely so far as substitutionary work is concerned. Such was the meaning of those glorious words of our Lord when he said, It is finished. He had finished transgression, made an end of sin, and brought in everlasting righteousness. Therefore, perfected forever uh, the believing ones who are set apart for him. Now, with the work of the Lord, with the work of Christ, we cannot meddle. We're never told to partner with him to work out our salvation. No, but we are to receive it by faith. 
The blessing comes to him that works not but believes on him that justifies the ungodly. Justification is not at all by human effort, but by the free gift of God. This then is a brief summary, a brief overview, a brief summary of what it means of a work for us. Christ fulfilled and perfected the work for us. The second part of our salvation consists of a work in us. What do we mean by that? Well, the work in us, this is the, this is the operation of God, uh, the Holy Spirit in us. As many as were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, also in due time renewed by the Spirit in their minds. Or renewed, sorry, renewed in the spirit of their minds. The Holy Spirit in regeneration descends into man and creates in him a new nature. Now listen, when he creates in him a new nature, he does not destroy the old nature. That remains still to be battled with, right? And you have witnessed that you battle with it. I have witnessed that I battle with it. It's a reality to us that the old nature still remains to be battled with and to be overcome. Our dear beloved preacher, Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said, and I quote, Though the new nature with the spirit implants, so let me just repeat that. I quote, though the new nature which the spirit implants is perfect in its kind and its degree, yet it is not perfect in its development. You want to hear that again? Though the new nature which the spirit implants is perfect in its kind and in its degree, yet it is not perfect in its development. End quote. What does he mean by that? What is he saying? Well, what he's saying is, well, uh, the new nature in us is a seed which, which needs to work itself out into a tree. If I can put it to you that way. It's a seed in us that needs to work itself out into a tree. It's an infant which requires to grow into the stature of a perfect man. The new, na the new nature in us has in it all the elements of entire perfection. But it needs to be expanded. It needs to be brought out. To use the words of the text that we just read this evening, it needs to be worked out with fear and trembling. So God having first worked it in, it becomes the business of the Christian life to work out the secret inner principle until it permeates our entire being. Until it overcomes the old nature. In fact, until it utterly destroys the inbred corruption. And it reigns supreme in every part of our life. So we see that salvation is worked for us by Jesus Christ and worked in us by the Holy Spirit. What then does it, uh, what then is the work that we as believers need to do or have to do? What is the work that we as believers have to do? Well, number one, number one, we say, the first working out of our salvation has to do with, pertains with our personal conduct. Our personal conduct. By this I mean how we live for God on a daily basis. In this daily living, we don't just let go and let God. There's a responsibility on our part. Now, if you're not familiar with the phrase, let go and let God, it comes from a, a very group of people who teach that. Uh, it refers to a teaching that uh, some believers have where they just say, well, I'm, I'm just going to do nothing. I'm just, it's, it's all up to God. I'm going to do nothing. The, the believer in, in that teaching, just, he just sits back and let go and, and let God just do what he needs to do. Now, Paul says the opposite to that. Paul says the opposite to let go, let go and let God. He says the opposite. Paul says there's a responsibility on our part. We need to be doing something post-salvation. For example, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, he says, uh, Paul says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win 
Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are an, an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as, as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Recognizing there's something that Paul is doing here, right? In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 16, he says, Not that I have already attained, or not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which is also, uh, that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the, for the prize of the upward call of my God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. Again, there's something Paul is doing here. There's a responsibility that he has. He says the same to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. He says, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. He says, flee from evil. There's an action there. There's a responsibility there that Timothy has. He has to flee from evil. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and, 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 and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, Paul says in uh, 1, Corinthians, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 to 12. So flee from evil is the responsibility here of Timothy. We see then from these, verse, from these examples of the verses that I've just given you, just a few, that there is a, a work for each of us to do when we're saved. Now, this is not a matter of let go and let God, meaning that uh, God will make sure my behavior and my character is Christian. No. He says that we have a part to play in this. We have to work at it. We have to work out our salvation in that sense. That was number one. Number two, working out our salvation pertains also, has to do with also to a faithful perseverance on our part. A faithful perseverance on our part. Now you have seen in the scriptural text that I've given you um, good points there to, to make this case, but let me explain this a little further. You see, salvation has three dimensions. Brother Bernard prayed this morning about these three dimensions, actually. Salvation has three dimensions. The past dimension, the present dimension, and the future dimension. What do we mean by that? Well, the past dimension comes under the banner of justification. Justification. When we placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we were justified. Question 33 of the Westminster Catechism asks the question, what is justification? The answer given, justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us in, as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Justification. So the past dimension of salvation is under the banner of justification. The present, the present dimension of salvation is under the banner of sanctification. So there's justification and sanctification. This is the present time uh, between justification. So sanctification is here. It's the present time between justification and the believer's death or the believer's rapture, whichever is to come. Question 35 of the Westminster Catechism asks, what is sanctification? The answer given, sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live righteously. From this we notice that we are renewed by the word and the spirit in sanctification. We are renewed by the word and the spirit. 
How does the word of God enter, enter you so that you are renewed in sanctification? Well, the answer is simple. You have to work at it. What is the work that you put in? You have to read your Bible. You have to study your Bible. You have to listen to a sermon. You have to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. You have to meditate on what you've heard. You have to apply what you've learned. Whose responsibility is that? That's yours. Your responsibility. Justification, sanctification, past, present. What about the future? Well, the future dimension, you already know it, is glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. This is when salvation is complete and all believers receive their glorified bodies. Three dimensions, justification, sanctification, glorification. So understanding these three dimensions of salvation, we can then say, we can then say as um, one of our favorite preachers, Donald Gray Barnhouse is very good at saying this. He says, believers have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. Believers have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. What is he talking about? He's talking about justification, sanctification, and glorification. In brief, then, we can say believers are called to pursue a life of righteousness by sanctification until we are glorified or until the time of glorification. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 to 14. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in, in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or, or obtained or, or, or have already become perfect, but I press on to that, to that I may lay hold of that which... Also, I, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Believers have been saved, are being saved, and will be saved. So having understood salvation as past, present, and future, we are to persevere until the day of glorification. This perseverance on our part is an active part and not a passive part. Remember I said, let, let go and let God, let go and let God is a, is a, is a passive part. I, I do nothing. No, but we have an active part to play. And I, the, the scriptural uh, evidence I gave you from Paul's writing that we have to do, there's an active part on ourselves. Passive meaning without response. There's a response on our part. There's an active role that we play. It involves taking care of our salvation. That's what it means. It involves taking care of our salvation. Uh, it is that which God has entrusted us with. God has blessed us with this gift of salvation. He's blessed us with righteousness. He's blessed us with eternal life. And it's, it's what we do. To, it, it involves taking care of that gift of salvation. God's word sanctifies us, right? One of the ways we take care of our salvation, God's word sanctifies us. And Jesus prayed for us in John 17, 17, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. So then we find working out your salvation then is a means that God has ordained for you as the believer to be taken care of. But we can also say, but we can also say that working out your salvation also means the care of others. So there's the care of yourself, working out your salvation. But we can also talk about the work of working out your salvation as the care of others. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, the work out of the text where it says work out, it could also mean that which comes out of you. Work out of you. Every believer in Christ is called to be a witness to someone else. Every believer in Christ is called to be a witness to someone else. There isn't a single person sitting here today. There isn't a single Christian on the face of the planet that hasn't been called to do this, to be a witness to someone else. 
We are forbidden by our Lord to just sit back, fold our arms and say, well, I'm saved and that's it. I'm just going to sit back and wait for the chariot. I'm just going to sit back and wait for the rapture. I'm just going to sit back and wait until I meet with the Lord. Now, this is what some are accustomed to, right? It's hard to believe that, but this is what some are accustomed to. But I say to you, my friends, most boldly, that to think in such a way is forbidden in Scripture. There is a work that must be done. God having worked in us, he now bids us to work and that work to come out of us for someone else. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10, we read it earlier on. Again, I say to you, by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The work that God has prepared for us, we need to work out of us. So we are saved to serve, right? There's no discussion about it. <laughs> no discussion needs to be had about it. No commission needs to be called about this. No church board meeting needs to be held about this. There is no discussion to be had about this. We are called to serve. And if you're not serving the Lord in the work he has instructed you, then you are either a non-believer masquerading as a believer or you are a believer walking in disobedience or you're a believer who just doesn't care. Then you're not a believer at all, right? So there's really basically two categories. A believer who's disobedient or somebody who's masquerading as a believer. So we're called to serve. We're saved to serve. And that serving is evident in what is worked out of us. Our salvation then is worked out of us when we are, as Jesus teaches us, salt and light in the world. When we are the salt and light to the world, then that's all, that is being worked out of us. That's the work of God being worked out of us. That settles that part. Having understood that part, what does it mean then? The next part, our text is careful to give us the attitude in which we are to work this. We understand it needs to be worked out of us, but what is the attitude? Well, the attitude that we have is, the text is very clear to us. Paul is very clear to us. He says it, it must be in fear and trembling. It must be in fear and trembling. How do we understand this? What does it mean, fear and trembling? Well, maybe the following quote from a respected Bible teacher will help us understand this. He said, and I quote, Did you ever, ever have committed to you to your care something exceedingly rare and precious something of singular beauty or untold, untold value did you ever have come into possession of something uh, long and ardently desired which you had thought to be too good too sweet too lovable ever to be really yours your very own was there an awe and almost terror in the sense of that possession did you not say to yourself who am I that I should have this what if I should drop it? What if I should lose it? Did not the very joy make you afraid and your happiness make you tremble? <laughs> End quote. So, so precious is it that I am happy to have it, but I understand also that it's so precious that I'm fearful that I have it. There's also another reason we talk about fear here. Why? There is another cause of fear here. There is another cause of trembling here. What is that? Well, it's because we're dealing with God. An omnipotent God. A holy, holy, holy God. It's an awful thing working with God. What a responsibility is it we have. What a position for a poor man, for a sinner man to be in. Would that which God has entrusted us with, we say, what if my shortcomings and my sins should deprive me of my friendship with God, of my relationship with God? 
And so having this possession, this great possession that has been given to me by God, there is a fear and trembling in me. That I should lose it, that I should forget about it, that I should, uh, that, that, that I should in some way uh, 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 not care for it. But also there's this fear and trembling because I know where it comes from. It doesn't come from man, it's come from God. So in dealing with it, there is a fear and trembling. Sobering thought, right? When we speak of fear and trembling, we're not speaking of it in the sense of the world, but we're speaking of it in the sense of a reverential fear. And that reverential fear is the attitude of the heart. It's the attitude of the heart towards God, towards a holy God. And I tell you, my friends, today, if you take nothing from this, if you're training for the ministry, if you feel God calling you to do something, you need to know this loud and clear. This fear is a very, very helpful thing. Very helpful. I know a man when he takes to the pulpit and he does not fear is a man that I cannot trust. When I'm in conversation with people and there's a almost haphazardness and an almost callous nature and almost like sweeping nature that they can do this, then I get concerned. I get, I get concerned. Spurgeon was very helpful to me. I thought I was the only man who was trembling and shaking when I took to the pulpit in the new church. And Spurgeon was very helpful to me when he wrote in his diary, he said, every time I take to the pulpit, the people do not see my knees knocking. Why? Because of the weight of God that was upon him. He knew he was dealing with that which was precious to God. What if I should, what if I should mess this up? What if I should make a mess of the text? And the people go astray. So there was this fear. And I say it is a good thing. It is a good fear. I want this fear. I do not want this fear to depart from me. I want this fear. And people say every time, they say, well, you know, you, every time we take to the pulpit in the public square, they come up, Christians come up and say, oh, you know, you are so brave. And, and you, know, you know, this, that and the other. And I, the first thing I say to them, no, I'm not brave. I say to them, I'm not brave. God help me if I say on that day, oh, I'm here to, I'm brave, I can do this. There has to be that fear. That fear causes us to see that we are not capable. We are not capable. We are not capable at all, but we need the ever-present help of our God. As soon as you say that, oh, I can do this, you've left God out completely. No, I will say the opposite. I can't do it. I'm incapable of doing it. And, that, and, and, and admitting that, showing that, that you're incapable, makes room, enough room for God to step in and to help. You say also on fear, and I don't mean to go off the topic, I say also on fear, fear keeps us from exalting self. Fear keeps us from exalting self. When, you know, when we learn God's word, when we read a lot of books, when we have a library, as most reformed people have, that's one end of the room to the other end of the room, and we're constantly buying books and constantly going to Banner of Truth and whoever it is and conference after conference, and we're developing our apologetics. I tell you, we can develop an arrogance and a pride. I've seen it already. I've seen it with ministers and people that I sometimes have fellowship with. We become expert in our apologetics and experts at how to answer the Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth and so on. And, and don't misunderstand, we must, be, we must be good at our apologia. We must be good at giving a, a reasonable response for the belief and the hope that we have. But understand also that we must guard ourselves that, 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 that pride does not set in to say, I can do that. I got the answer to that. So fear then is, a, is helpful because it prevents pride and arrogance from setting in. Having understood that, then we know that we are not immune from arrogance and pride. We must always make a confession of our spiritual weakness. By this I mean we must do it daily. We must do it daily. 
This pride is a sin. I tell you, my friends, what day would you leave? I'm preparing another sermon series already. I'm talking about the sin of sin. I'm talking about why sin is so bad that it is sin and how dangerous sin is. We often, we often, I tell you, my friends, we, we, we take a very careless approach when we talk of sin. Sin is the most dangerous thing. It's the, as David said, it's the, it's the disease of my bones. How foolish we are to think, how foolish we are to think that we can go one day without, without acknowledging that sin, sin is still there. And sin can still destroy. And sin can still bring destruction. And that's why Paul tells us, pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, pray continually. Seek God's help. I'm putting together my notes for that. I don't think it will be a long series, but a, nevertheless a fairly good series that will benefit. It's certainly benefiting my life in, in, in sanctification, and I hope to bring it to you that as you hear it, you too will find sanctification in that. So the confession of spiritual weakness is manifested in the trembling here, in the trembling of, of verse 12. We tremble before God, knowing our spiritual weakness, and our tendency to sin and to exalt self. Paul therefore says that we are to work out our salvation with both fear and trembling. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work his... Sorry, let's repeat that. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh-huh. Shall we read it again? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good. Hold on, is there a contradiction here? In verse 12, we saw that we have a responsibility to work. We have a responsibility to work out our salvation. Now we come to verse 13 and we say, hold on a moment. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What's going on here? Which is it then? Is it me working or is it God working? What is Paul saying here from one verse to the other? Is it me working or is it God working? Well, the answer is both. The answer is both. Although the believer is responsible to work as seen in verse 12, it is the Lord who is the source of the good works in us and through us. What we find here is the understanding of the believer's responsibility and the power of God. In the Christian life, a, a, a matter of let go and let God, where we do nothing and God does everything, uh, uh, doesn't work, isn't, is not what God has ordained. What we find here is that both man and God working together here in this text. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 to 13 provides the answer for us that the sanctification of the believer is the responsibility of both God and man. Both God and man. I gave you the evidence for that earlier on about how we are to read, we are to study, we are to uh, open up our Bible, we are to meditate upon God's Word. Okay, I'll stop right here. Part two next week. <laughs> we'll finish off. <laughs> All right. I do hope that uh, I was going to go a little further with part one, but uh, my notes are a little extensive, so we'll stop here. Let us pray.